What's up, everybody? Special edition of 40 Club coming at you. He's Tommy Ashley. I'm Joey Powell. This is an Inside Carolina podcast. And you know what the 40 Club's about. It's when we actually get, um, you know, big-time UNC players, alumni, fans, what have you, just to talk about non-sporting stuff, non-current stuff, and kind of get the story behind the story. And joining us right now is probably uh, one of the most beloved, and I think will be as, as history looks back, one of the most beloved Tar Heels in Carolina basketball history, he's um, he's sneakily close to breaking the uh, UNC scoring record, but did break the all-time rebound record. And most importantly, he's an honorary board member of the MIFON Foundation, Armando Baycott. Mondo, what's up, bud? What's good? What's good? Good to see you all. Yeah, man. Appreciate you making time for Tommy and I. And and uh, Tommy, I, there's so much that we can talk to Mondo about. Um, so let's just let's go all over the place. Mondo, I'm going to come to you first. What made you commit to Carolina when you first came to you, or, you know, when you first decided to come to UNC? Because I feel like it came out of nowhere. Yeah, it was really just a feeling. I had no clue that I was going to commit to Carolina when I committed. I was just sitting on my couch one day, and me and Coach Williams, we were having a pretty long conversation. And then I really thought about it. I was like, you know what? I want to come here. And I just told him, and I hadn't even told my parents. And that's really the story behind it. It was nothing in particular is just talking to coach Williams. I was like, I could definitely see myself being with him every day and playing for this university. What's your relationship with coach Williams like? Oh, I mean, I still talk to him all the time. He uh, called me when I was in Vegas and was just checking on me, making sure everything was all good. And I mean, just little stuff like that. When you think of somebody like coach Williams, who's such a big time person, but to, go and check on everybody because he had not just called me. He was calling all the former players. So that just speaks on just how great of a person he is. When you look back, uh, I mean, Roy Williams, everybody, you know, knows his standing in North Carolina basketball history and as a coach and everything else he's done for the program. What do you think when he's, when you heard he's retiring? I mean, what goes through the head of a player – that has committed to him, committed to Carolina, has this relationship with the coach, and he says, I'm done. Yeah, I actually knew uh, before, like, everybody that Coach Williams was retiring. Uh, my family, we was, I was like, we were, like, one of the only people that he told just because I was in a situation where I really didn't know, like, if I was going to come back or uh, go somewhere else. And I knew, like, they wanted me to be a huge, like, building point for the uh the new um part of carolina so it was still a shock when my mom at first told me because she didn't tell me originally like she just kind of kept it in there because i mean she probably thought i have a big mouth for tell people but <laughs> i kind of knew like two or three days before like everyone else had knew but my mom she had knew and i mean i knew it would be crazy like once it was announced and then they're coming out on april uh fool's day that was like made it even crazier than what it was going to be. Was it uh, was it chaotic for the players on the player side? I mean, your coach is leaving, and I know Carolina likes to keep everything in-house, Carolina family and all that, but still, I mean, what was it like being a player yeah. in that situation? It was wild because I remember who's just telling us we had a Zoom and everyone needed to be on there, and it was after the season, so everybody was confused. Like, we didn't know what it was about. The majority didn't know what it was about. And I want to say 10, 15 minutes before this that happened, uh, it got leaked before we could even get on a meeting. But we ended up talking about it, and Coach Williams said he was retiring, and everybody was honestly, like, just kind of shocked. And then it was another shocker, too, when we found out Coach Davis was going to be the coach because we didn't know Coach Davis was, like, even going to want to still coach. I know he loved coaching under Coach Williams, and we just had no clue that Coach Davis would even still coach. What was that transition period like? Because again, like you know, we were covering it, and obviously, there's all this discussion about who's get, you know, who's being interviewed, and yeah. who's being talked about, and you you've always had a really good pulse of the rest of your teammates and kind of understanding the locker yeah. room. What was that like when you guys would start seeing names pop up here and there? Because even if you try to avoid the media, you're still going to hear that stuff. I know it was going to be Coach Davis. So for me, that was great because obviously he was a coach that recruited me and we all love Coach Davis, just his energy, his spirit. He was always the coach under Coach Williams where like if he was struggling or something, you needed somebody to go to to just kind of give you a pep talk and just make you feel better. It was Coach Davis. He was really confident. So like 
me knowing that, I knew that Coach J was going to be the coach even before it was announced. So for me, that was huge. And I knew immediately I wanted to come back just because I had so much trust in Coach Davis. And obviously, he has a lot of playing experience. But also, too, he coached under Coach Williams for a long time. He was in the media, too. So it was a lot of good qualities that he had to be a great coach. And then for the other guys, I mean, everybody was just kind of assuming who was next because obviously Wes Miller, he was an attractive candidate, too. And I mean, it was probably a little early on for him to be just go right into being the head coach of Carolina just because he was coming from, was it UNCG? Mm -hmm. But I mean, for us, it was either Coach Davis or obviously Coach Miller. I think for those, that's what made the most sense. But I mean, I remember it got crazy too. People saying like maybe Brad Stevens or like <laughs> there was some crazy names being thrown out there. And I mean, Carolina's probably the best coaching job in college basketball. Maybe Carolina, Kansas, one of the two. So. We knew it would be some crazy names, but, I mean, Carolina, we keep everything in house. Like you said, it's the 40 club, so it had to be one of the two. So when when Coach Davis took the job, you know, it was it was it seemed like a seamless transition. You know, the family stays intact. It's kind of the next lineage, and obviously that was kind of who Coach Williams wanted to, to take over. What's something people don't know about Hubert Davis? Because I know y'all used to – Y'all used to, to joke with him a lot, and you had a special relationship with him. What, what's something that people don't know about Coach? I think we've we've learned he can be fiery. We know he's yeah. very he's very all shucks and you know using words like fart and and <laughs> and and dumb. Yeah. But what's something people don't know about Coach Davis that that you learned playing for him? He is trash talker. <laughs> um, he always like poking funny like me or RJ like talking trash to us or like a lot of the times he'll be like let's say if we like in a game and it's halftime and it's rough or something like that he'll be like y'all lucky I wasn't playing because I'll be ready to kick one of y'all butts and stuff like that just little stuff like that and it's funny because it's stuff you would like hear from coach Williams too because he would like say stuff like that too like <laughs> I remember once in practice I can't remember it was like me and Dayron or something and we was like doing something and he was like um if I was 6'11 I'd whoop all y'all and it was just funny just hearing that. So <laughs> it's just like stuff like that. Can can Hubert still play? He can still shoot. I think that's something. <laughs> it's it's just like kind of like a golf swing to him. It's like something you just don't lose. He can still shoot for sure. That's hilarious. And he would get out there too. And and sometimes you know if he was demonstrating something, and he could still move. He's still athletic for sure. He could he could put it in the bucket when he was in school and then in the pros. Yeah. Let, let me spin back, and I mentioned this before we started. I wanted to ask you, go way back to the Bahamas in 2019. We were yeah. down there covering you guys. Um, you pretty much had one of your most dominant performances, especially at, to that point, against Oregon. Interviewed you. You know, everybody was hyped that win. It's a good win against a good squad. What would you today tell that kid – that went off against Oregon, what, five years ago, almost six years ago, what would you tell him now? And, and are you surprised um, how things have turned out? Yeah, I would just say just don't get too high on your highs and don't get too low on your lows. I was feeling myself after that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this college thing might be easy. I was like, okay. <laughs> and what I mean – also, too, I probably would have told myself uh, we were going to suck because I thought after that, I'm like, we're going to be a good team, too. And obviously, that was a pretty bad team that year. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I mean, the 2019 year was just so crazy because, like, honestly, like, of all my years at Carolina, that was the – other than this year, the team that had the most fight, like, to even win, what, 10 games that year was crazy. Like, with just all the injuries we dealt with and just the, as a talent level, we were – we had no talent, but, like, we lost seven games by, like, a buzzer beat or something like that. And mm -hmm. we just had so much fight. Like, I feel like Coach Williams, like, got the most out of that team of what he could just because it was a rough year, man. I mean, like, I was banged up. And, obviously, I had my struggles. I wasn't that good. And then, like, really all we had was Garrison because Cole was hurt too. So, it was a rough year. Did, did you ever think that going through that year that you'd be playing for Carolina – Four years later, five years later. Uh, honestly, no. I, I didn't really have no idea. Like, I wasn't in a rush to do anything. But, I mean, obviously, like, the way it all played out, I really wouldn't change anything. 
But uh, I knew I needed to come back uh, around the time after I came back from my first injury. Because, I mean, at first I thought it was smooth sailing. Like I said, after the Michigan game, I'm like, okay, college might be a little easy. Then I started to get in conference play, and I'm like, okay, I'm not ready. What's that like, man? I mean, because, again, you, you, you're – incredibly highly rated coming out of high school um yeah. you know big man and, and big man's game is different from from any other position um you, you have it fairly you know you look fairly dominant uh in the bahamas like tommy mentioned yeah what was your what was kind of your holy bleep moment where you realized oh i'm, I, I'm not ready <laughs> like what was there was there one moment or was it just a series of maybe some struggles either physically or or mentally you were just like man <laughs> this is this is this is not it <laughs> Probably the Wofford game. I went like one for 13, and I was like struggling, struggling mentally and on the court. And I was like, I already had in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get through this year. But next year, everybody going to have to see me. So it was so, just one of those things where I just had to get through the year because I was just mentally after that game, I was shot. So I want to ask, um, you mentioned injuries, and I don't think people really uh, can appreciate how hurt you were off and on during your career. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, was hidden from the media and kept in house for obvious reasons. And, and there was a lot of times where I think you were playing through stuff that maybe even the staff didn't know how bad it was. Right. Yeah. Um, what was the, what was the ankle like in 2022 in the final four? I think it was, it was obvious to everybody watching that you were not you. And it was obvious that you were struggling to run. It's a walk, but, but tell everybody how bad it really, really was. It was terrible, man. Uh, both of my ankles was messed up, and obviously, I rolled. What was it? The left ankle. I think it was it the right. Ankle. It was one of those ankles. But I mean, before the game, I didn't even warm up. I came out there with like four minutes left and just laced them up and played because I was in the back with Coach May trying to figure out how I can get myself ready to go out there and play, and I just couldn't get a feeling. But then I don't know if it was adrenaline that kicked in or what, but like I just figured out a way to get through it and. I think I really gassed out in that second half. The first half, I really gave my all. And after that, I was just like, it was tough. And it sucked because it really came down to that one rebound. And then on the play, too, even when I rolled my ankle, I felt like I had a good angle. I felt like I had a chance to score. And just fortunately not happen like that, it was tough. But, I mean, I think it just shows just, like, how much depth really is. Because, I mean, y'all remember, like, this year, like, our rotations, we played a lot of people. But those first two years, we were going, like, five six deep like y'all remember like it was we was playing 38 minutes a game like so oh yeah Thanks. it was the, what they called it. the name was the iron five and it's literally it was it was it was y'all and <laughs> and nobody else maybe maybe you'd get a little bit of extra minutes off the bench but it was not a lot at all yeah we didn't play many people at all so it really showed us like depth really means a thing i mean it came all the way down to the last game to see it what um and this is a question. I know what it was like in the stands at, at mm -hmm. halftime of the national. The, the Duke game's on another level for myself yes. in the Final Four. But sure. half t halftime in the stands at the national in the national championship game against Kansas, um, fifteen point lead or whatever it was. What was it like in the locker room then? I'm I'm getting ready. I'm thinking of my poses. I'm gonna do on the camera when the confetti <laughs> falls. <laughs> I thought we had a man, but like I said, I think we all just gassed out, man. Like, we were playing on little to no fumes. Um, Caleb was banged up. Brady was banged up. Leaky, RJ, like, we literally gave our all in that first half. It was nothing left we had, and it was just tough, man, because we just struggled with death, really, but came down to that one rebound, so it was tough. It was tough. That's all I can say. It was just tough, but I think that's him. We fought hard, and just the whole journey of that year, just how it all went. Like, I really think it revived, like, Carolina just as a school in general because we had a tough spell, like, obviously coming out of COVID. Then my freshman year was tough. Then for us to just bring that magic back and as an AFC make it that far, it brought all the fun back, and it was huge. Yeah, definitely. In a crazy scene there in New Orleans, couldn't have been in a better place to have that, that, that run and that Duke game. Well, and, and I don't – I mean, I know you guys like to trash talk Duke and State and all that too much, and I don't, I don't necessarily want you to do that. But what was it about playing Duke, especially that year? Because that mm -hmm. Duke team was stacked. And we hated guys... each other. Like, 
of all my years, like that was the most like I think in terms of like back and forth teams, like it was a like genuine hate for each other. Like they wanted to beat us, we wanted to beat them. I mean, you could remember uh remember Theo John and <laughs> the captions on the Instagram pictures and all that. Uh what was it? Oh, <laughs> You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, he's yeah. Like oh something yeah. Like you... Oh, what was the caption? I can't think of it. But it was it, they—they we they were, were very, very vocal. Oh, like, it was a, it was everyone a savage until they come face to face with one or something like that. And then <laughs> Caleb had um, redid it uh, after we beat them at Duke. <laughs> so going into the next game, it was already crazy. And then I remember the interview too where we both wanted to play each other, and we both ended up losing to Virginia Tech. And then for it to all come for the first time ever, Duke versus UNC in the tournament, in the Final Four, Coach K last game, Coach Davis' first game as a Final Four coach. I mean, it was just crazy. And that Duke team was so talented, but we were talented too. Like, we were like the perfect matchup for them. So something I think a lot of Carolina fans are going to remember you for, not only for – you know, I mean, it, it, when when you and I did a hospital visit for me, fine. You remember the kid run up to you, just, just randomly said, "You retired, Coach K. I love you." <laughs> uh, do, yes. do you re, do you remember the photo that where you know Caleb left the left it all for and you got the dunk and literally you're hanging on the rim and you're looking right at the camera and you got this just amazing just just scream like you can hear the scream in a photo. Uh, yes. What's what's going through your mind right there? Like how cathartic was that, or what's what was that moment for you? I know you know the moment I'm talking about because it made so many T-shirts and so many memes forever. Yeah, I mean, if you want me to be completely honest with you, when I dunked that ball, I'm thinking, man, what are we gonna do tonight? I knew it was gonna be a great night after that. <laughs> I knew it was gonna be a great night. I was like, <laughs> it's so crazy because like with like 30 seconds left, all I'm thinking about is, man, we're gonna be turned up tonight. <laughs> and man, that was that was definitely one of my best nights at Carolina in terms of fun and just getting the full experience. Like that's when I finally really start to feel the love like from Carolina because it was such a big game and just the excitement from the fans and being able to be on Franklin Street. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I'll be honest, I think between that and the and the final four, you know, you and, and your teammates from that team are probably minted in Chapel Hill forever. Like there's nothing anybody can ever take from you from that one single series uh, of, of wins booking it between, you know, the start and, and the coach Kegler. And, and I don't, I don't mind digging into this, but like there was so much talk about that being coach K's final game. It's like, it's like North Carolina wasn't even there. What yeah. was going through your minds? Cause we've all heard the story about what coach Davis told y'all and how he yeah. told you before y'all left, we're going to go over there and win. What's going through your mind, man? You're a competitive dude. You're you talk a little bit of noise too. What was what was it like for you when the game actually started? What was what was going through your head? Oh, it was great because we had no pressure and I mean nobody expected us to win. And going into that game, like we just had a different mentality. It was just something about our approach that whole week. Like we hadn't even really talked about the game. Like it was just more about just us and we wanted to come in there and just prove everybody wrong. And I think we all were just like honestly just pissed off going into there and I can remember before the game just us having a speech like we're gonna either win the game or we're gonna win the fight but we just wanted to make it known that we were there that night and I think just having that approach and that we wanted to throw the first punch like just everything it just all came together did it help playing teams and, and not necessarily do but when they had a guy like Theo John that would just run his mouth to that What's that do to a competitor like yourself, to Caleb, to Ardre, to Brady Manick, who who yeah. didn't know anything about Duke Carolina other than what he had seen? Is it beneficial to have somebody talking smack like that? For sure. It was great because it brought out the best in all of us. I mean, Paolo was a great player. He talked trash. Uh, Trevor, Wendell, we all were talking trash, and that's what made it just so fun because it was two teams that were just trying to compete and go out there and win. and. I mean, we just know it was so much at stake just for that game. Even maybe, I won't say just more, but just as much as the Final Four game. Like, it all just felt like it was so much at stake. Like, the face of the rivalry was dependent on those games. So, it was great to be on the winning side of it, especially the Final Four one, because I know we wouldn't have heard the end of it. <laughs> no, and they could, other than winning the national championship game over Carolina, they can never get that one back. And yeah. uh, what was it like? from your standpoint, when Caleb hits a shot in New Orleans? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, just the grit and the toughness to go up there and take that shot. And, I mean, y'all know Caleb, like, 
he not scared of the moment. Just to go up and hit that shot, it was like one of the best feelings ever because at that point I knew we had won. We had won up four. And, I mean, just the excitement. I almost passed out because I was on the sideline. And when he hit that shot, I <laughs> jumped up. Then it was one of the best feelings ever. All right, a couple more, then we'll do some word association. We'll let you get out of here, man. Um, so what's something that, that people, you know, I, I think a lot of folks think that they know uh, the story a lot of time because, you know, UNC is such a high-profile program. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people think they know the story about something and they really don't have a clue. What's one of those that happened for you during your time at Carolina? Like where everybody, you know, there was always this perception on the outside of, of what was going on. Yeah. Inside the locker room, or maybe just your perspective on it was totally different than what the narrative was. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question. I think really, I mean, my senior year, I think it was a lot of people thinking that we didn't like each other in the locker room and all that, but we loved each other. Like, me, Caleb, RJ, Pete, Leakey, like, it was a great team. We really loved each other. Like, obviously, we didn't meet expectations, but, like, all throughout the year, it was no drama. Like, it was really great. Like, a lot of stuff got blown out of proportion, but that team, we really loved each other. We hung out all the time. It just didn't work out. So, one more, and then I, th I think Tommy's got a, a pretty good one he wants to hit you with. Uh, Who's your favorite teammate, man? I mean, you know, everybody always to make the old jokes about Armando being in college for so long. But, I mean, you had a really different rollover of, of characters that came through that locker room. I mean, it was the first time we saw a, a transfer. Favorite make a teammate. Future. Yeah, favorite oh, that's teammate. A, oof, that's tough. <laughs> I've had so many favorites. We'll make it easier. What's a low? What's what's an underrated teammate that folks? I can give you a top three favorite. Yeah. I'm not gonna count Cole because that was my freshman year. Um, Garrison Brooks, I love Garrison. Still to this day, we talk every week. Um, RJ, gotta say RJ, of course. I might have to probably say Dayron. I love playing with Dayron. It was so much fun playing with him because he's one of those guys where, like, I knew if he was on the court with me, we was gonna have a lot of fun. <laughs> and underrated, underrated teammate that I really loved, Cormac. Me and Cormac, we talk every day. Uh, we really kind of hit it off after this year, and we're gonna hang out at some point before the season starts. So Cormac, I love Cormac. That's a cool deal. Yeah, see, and he was there for one year and made yeah. a mark. I, I want to ask you something somewhat serious before we have a little fun with it. NIL is a huge thing. Obviously, mm -hmm. everybody listening to this, I'm sure, listened to you and Theo Pinson talking on his show about the, the amounts of money and, and all that that you guys are able to make. Yeah. But what does that come with? Other than bank in your pocket, sort of speak to – I know during the season or at some point you talked about how – People get fired up if you don't perform, and I've bet on you. You know what I mean. Yeah. So, did, did you? Do you guys feel that? Is that an added pressure of being an athlete? When, okay, now I'm getting paid. I'm not just a quote unquote college student playing basketball. I'm getting paid a lot of times more money than the fans yeah. that are watching. What What's that like? Is there any pressure? Is there any trash that comes from that? Just sort of the negative benefit yeah. or the negative yeah. of nil. Yeah, for some, I think for a lot of, like, the younger guys, like, if I was coming in as a young guy making this amount of money and doing all those different things, I definitely wouldn't have been ready for it. I probably would have been on the news for something crazy uh, on Twitter or something if I had all this money coming in as a freshman. So I think for the younger guys, it's definitely a transition because you come in making all this money and, I like you said, the added pressure of the fans and you got people sports betting on you now in North Carolina and all that. It's all crazy, but... Honestly, like for me, um, other than like when I first started to get it this year, it was just really smooth sailing. Obviously, like I've probably made a few dumb purchases and decisions like that. But other than that, I mean, it's been great having a good amount of money because you get access to a lot of things, you know, that you didn't have. So what what's give me some things you never would have done, but for NIL and opportunity. Uh, probably like. Some of the watches I got, I definitely wouldn't have had those. So, 
the wash I love is that. A, for sure. I'm a I love the guy. honesty. I love <laughs> the honesty, man. That's um. All right, so I'll give you one question. We're gonna do some word association. All right. Uh, I would I would rather blank than lose to NC State. Die. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I knew I knew you'd come real with it tonight. All right, so Tommy and I are going to take some turns. We'll alternate on some word association. So uh, I'll, I'll say a word, and you give me the first thing that comes to mind. And you know, if you go a couple words, that's fine. Cole Anthony. Funny. DJ Burns. <laughs> hey. Really? All right. <laughs> nah, that's my guy. Uh, DJ, actually, I'll, I'll give him a good one. Skilled. That's Definitely. fair. I, game was, he, game. was he one of the toughest guys to guard or not? And, like, who gave you the most buckets? Who who could who did you have the most trouble with? The most trouble I've ever had with somebody was probably uh, in, a, in the Bahamas this year with Eric Dixon. Yeah. That was like, I honestly, I didn't know he had all that in his bag. <laughs> I don't and think he, he did either. Caught, he caught fire. That was that was a tough one. I was pissed off for like a few weeks after that. I ain't <laughs> telling nobody. But I was after that game. I said, literally, I finished top three in defense play of the year just because of that game. I was like, after that, nobody's ever treated me like that again. That was probably the one of the most embarrassing days of my life at UNC. But I mean, DJ, he was definitely one of the tougher ones. I mean, that last game, that was a tough game for sure against him because, I mean, they were knocking down shots and, like, we usually don't double, so it was tough. And he was making jump hooks from the free throw <laughs> line. So it was a tough one. I mean, he's definitely one of my tougher matchups. Uh, Apollo was probably my toughest matchup. Toughest person for me to, like, have to score on, though, probably would be Derek Lively. That was I had to bring my A game versus him for sure. So much length, man. Um, so what? So so what made Brady have success against Paolo in the Final Four and, and in those games? Because y'all switched. Because you had him in the first game of that, you know, in the Smith Center, and he like he gave you props. And, and then yeah. Mannix out there getting beat to death, but had some success. I mean, how does that happen? Uh, luck. <laughs> That's part of the game, right? Luck and a lot of yeah, just honestly luck. It ain't really much you could do, with Apollo. Well, it's, it was, especially when he gets his shoulder turned, it's uh, yeah. he starts going downhill. All right, let's do some more word association. Uh, Caleb Love, killer. Is he the most misunderstood guy you've ever been around, as far as oh, outside? Sure. We're gonna look back five, ten years, and I think Caleb will get more appreciation than he does. Why do you think that? Why do you think that he? Because he's love hate guy for Carolina. Why, why is that? I mean, I just think because he was, he was the guy not scared to take the big shots. So, I mean, he would make some, but he would miss some too. Yeah. Uh, The number five. The best number at UNC. Who wearing number five this year, actually? I don't even they know. They got some, some, some. We had a good run with number five, so. God, who who's wearing it this year? Tommy, Tommy, we're so old. I don't even remember who had it this year. I'm looking up while y'all talking. Uh, Ty Lawson wore number five. Who's the best number five not named Baycott? Got to be him, right? Marcus Page. Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. That's what I mean. There's so many people that wore that number five and two are just real strong. And I see a little Tony Bradley. I mean, that number five and the number two got to be the best numbers at UNC. Doesn't look like anybody has number five unless one of the one of the freshmen. You know what? Maybe, uh, maybe K. Maybe he might wear number five. Oh, okay. What about um? Marcus Page or Ty Lawson? Best Carolina point guard. I mean, you got to go um, Phil Ford. But, I mean, if RJ put together a good little campaign this year, he, he going to be in that conversation with Ty Lawson and Marcus Page. Funny thing is, I think he already is, and that's and we've you know he's he's making people forget about Raymond Felton, and then I know it's you know, Felton was it. Felton was a killer too. All right, uh, King King Baycott, Tar Hill. I hope. <laughs> I, hope. I love that. Yeah, no, um, he's, he's different. He's gonna be good. All right, uh, I'll give you one more, and I'll and I'll see if Tommy's got another one after this. Duke fans. Haters. 
Um, you, know, you got another one? No, it's interesting because when we were in school, um, the Duke guys, and I was in school long before you were born, but like in 93, Duke players, a lot of Duke players would come to campus and play and party and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And State was the hated ones or whatever. How, is, has that changed over the years to you? Yeah, I feel like – I don't know, man. I feel like us versus Duke is still, like, we don't go over there. They don't go over here. But, like, we've been in Raleigh before. Like, we go to Raleigh sometimes. And, like, I done hung out with DJ before. Like, so I do hate NC State. But I think my hate with NC State is more, like, with the fan base. Like, I just can't stand the fan base. What's the worst thing somebody's ever said to you? And it's family friendly. (laughs) <laughs> call me call me ugly, stupid, stuff like that. Typical uh, stuff you'd expect from safe fans, you know. <laughs> I love that from you, man. Twist twist the knife. <laughs> All right, last question. We'll let you get out of here. Appreciate you making time for us, bud. Um if if and when basketball stops, what are you gonna do? I know you've got so many interests and there's so many things that, yeah. that get you fired up. What what do you want to do when basketball stops? I mean, it's so much stuff going through my head. Like, obviously, I want to do a lot of stuff in business, but probably, I don't know. I've been thinking I might want to get into politics. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I look, you, you thinking like <laughs> town councilor? Are you thinking state senator or congressman? What are you thinking? Something in the Senate, maybe. I've been thinking like Senate, something like that. I mean, but like, from- once I'm done playing, like probably like around the time I'm maybe like 35, 40, probably go back to school too. I want to get my doctorate, something like that. And, Obviously, got to get a couple more degrees and stuff. Man, aspirations. I love it. It may or may not be a UNC, though. Maybe UNC might. I don't know. We'll see. Harvard, I mean, maybe. I'm going to try to go somewhere. <laughs> somewhere nice. Every Everything's open to you, man. That's a crazy thing. Is it, you know, just you made this 40 year decision for North Carolina, and now you've, you're going to have all kinds of opportunities available to you, even more sure. than you already have. I might Mono, just we appreciate it. Man. Look. Uh, if uh, uh, we are very familiar with guys that come on this show that are very much better at this than we are, that will absolutely take our jobs sometime <laughs> soon. So, man, I appreciate you know, it. I'll be, you know, I'll be working with me fine now. That, that, that'll obviously be a part, of, a part of my, you know, journey too, of course. Love it. And we'll have you as long as you want to be a part of it. Tommy, you got anything for the big guy? No, just appreciate it, Armando. You know, you, you, you love Tar Heel, and it's cool to talk to you um, outside of the press conference and all that kind of realm. And, uh, just stay real. You always have Appreciate been. Just stay that way. Yeah, so yeah, I'm going to try to come up to a football game, so I'll pull up on you. Uh... All right, man. Mondo, we appreciate it, buddy. Take care of yourself. Appreciate this it, has bro. been the one of the things that we talk about with Armando is is why he made the decision to come to Carolina. He, that's what he opened up with about first. And I'd like to think Johnny T-Shirt had something to do with that. I mean, Johnny T-Shirt had been on Franklin Street since, since Tommy and I were wandering the campus. And – uh, I'm sure they were a big part of, of Mondo's visits, and, and I know his, his family has, has been in a Johnny T-shirt. We want you to go to Johnny T-shirt, too. Uh, as, as we record this, it's, uh, it's late summer. Um, football is going to be on us before we know it, and you can go into Johnny T-shirt and re-up your football gear. You don't want to be showing up to Keenan Stadium or even a roadie in some old gear. Get, get the new stuff. Johnny T-shirt has every single brand you can think of. And it all looks really good. Uh, if you want some NIL-themed things for your favorite player, they've got that for you. Inside Carolina premium subscribers know you get that extra 10% off the top of your order. So make sure you use the code on the premium message boards. Um, we know that that's, been, uh, that's certainly been a part of, of Mondo's time in Chapel Hill. We want it to be a part of your time the next time you're around. And if you don't come to Chapel Hill, just go to johnnytshirt.com. They'll take care of you. They're great folks. We appreciate so much about what they do supporting Inside Carolina, and we want you to support them. Yep, and Joey, one other of our sponsors, you know, Amanda Baycott talked about um, NIL and all that. He's got a ton of ideas. He's got a ton of um, support around the NIL community. He's made a lot of money on that. But also, um, people that watch this, they're small to mid-sized business owners, and they need all the help they can get as well in this environment. Congruity, congruityhr.com, you see the logo on the screen. Um they join Johnny T-Shirt as one of our best sponsors, and certainly they take care of you. Darren and Matt will do everything they can to build your business. This is a local business that is, has a national brand now. That's their goal for everybody they support. So go to Johnny, or excuse me, go to congruityhr.com. You can go to Johnny T-Shirt too and get some swag. And then while you're there, you go to 
congruityhr.com front slash Tar Heels. I got Dude, you. Hang on. You could go to a congruity, let them save you some money, and then spend the money at Johnny T-Shirt. Absolutely. And then you can save money at Johnny T-Shirt if you're an Inside Carolina Premium subscriber. You get 10% off. So, man, it's all it's all connected. We are a connected world, folks. And that's why I love congruity, that. congruityhr.com <laughs> and also johnnytshirt.com. Joey, it's always a pleasure to talk to these guys. Just, just in closing, and I wanted to say, I think – and he wouldn't really come out and say it as much, and maybe we didn't push him as much. But I think one thing that I've learned over the years doing this stuff for 25, 26 years mm -hmm. is that ultimately these players are regular kids. And especially yep. now that I've got college-age children, <laughs> as it's to a lot of people, you realize – I was sitting around last night. We had a cookout before everybody goes back to college. And we were talking about collegiate athletics and talking about, all of that. And then I'm looking at all these young men and I'm like, they're all y'all's age. Yes. There's just regular our age and Baycott granted Baycott's older than most. Um, and he mentioned Cormac Ryan older than most mm -hmm. due to the COVID um, situation and all that. But the bottom line is, is they're still young and learning just like we all did at that time. And uh, for him to be able to make uh, as much success as he has, not only on the basketball court, but off the basketball court, it sort of speaks to what type of people um, we're dealing with in college athletics, and I think people need to realize that. I think NILs changed the game for him. Uh, you know, he didn't talk about it as much today, but he, he he's gotten a lot of smack talked to him for not getting an extra rebound, mm -hmm. you know, and hitting my parlay and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So it's just an interesting dynamic. Pretty cool to talk to Baycott, who's one of the the preeminent athletes in this new era that we have i think and obviously i'm a little biased i don't mind so i can say it now that um now that armando has graduated in my full-time job I, I run a nonprofit organization and and we partner with armando and he did so many good things for us um and, and that would not have happened without nil and and when i say he was a good partner like he cared about the work we did he's um he's still engaged with us he's still donates his time and and merchandise and, and rare experiences that we're able to raise money off of uh, to help the families and help our mission. And, and I think he's just, I, I think so many people saw him as a big guy that stayed for five years. I think a lot of people appreciated his records and saw what he did on the court, but he's such a fascinating individual. And, and I don't think people will ever uh, be able to get their arms around what he was able to do off the court. And, and to your point, Tommy, I think he was the first guy in any sport to really understand NIL and make it really, really work for him. And I think that shows a lot of his business savvy. I think it shows a lot of where his, where his understanding of his own brand and, and how he was able to, to make this work for him. And I, I think he's just a great example of what the positives and the good things about NIL legislation has done for the college game. I think he's absolutely a, a poster, a, you know, poster child for that. Yep, indeed. All of this stuff we've talked about, we talked about with Greg Barnes on Next Level. Carolina NIL is a big deal. Um, and, and like you said, Baycott's one of the positive guys and one of the positive success stories for all this. Um, it's the new world we live in, and it's going yep. to be this way. And you need athletes like Baycott that not only take advantage of what they're allowed to earn, but also stick around and do some good with it and also stay at school, not go yep. to the highest bidder and all that. So it. An interesting world we live in. He's one of the good guys. I think history, and I, I kind of alluded to when we first started talking with him, I think history is going to look very kindly on Armando, not only as a player, but as a Tar Heel. I mean, if you remember what he said uh, after the game in Madison Square Garden that um, uh, that they won a couple of years ago, I think it was Ohio State, and just, or maybe it was in Charlotte, but he just said, you know, I love this university. I died for this university. He is just as much of a Tar Heel as anybody I think that I've ever spoken to. And I think history is going to shine brightly on him. Yep, indeed. Wrap us up. Let's get out of here. Another All right. 40 Club. This has been another 40 Club. Shout out to Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity for sponsoring. We appreciate Armando making time for us. Thomas, we'll talk to you very soon, man. Indeed. All right. Stay safe, Inside everybody. Carolina.com. Y'all be good.